Hi, you've met me at a very strange time in my life because my toilet's broken and today we're gonna fix it together with technology. Don't worry, there's no grossness in this video because it's just the clean water flush mechanism that's broken. There's a little plastic part in here that connects the push plate to the flush mechanism and that's broken off. These German flush boxes are all neatly built into the wall, but that means for replacing broken parts, you are dependent on manufacturer for still making that one exact part. So I thought, why not use this as an experiment to see which would be faster? Simply using CAT to draw up the part and printing a new one, or using 3D scanners uh, to just copy a functional one. Well, is that even how 3D scanners are supposed to be used? We will find out together after a message from today's sponsor, Private Internet Access. I like looking out my window, it's a nice view. Now in summer, there's birds out there, the flowers are blooming, but I don't think I'd want this to be the only window I could ever look out of. There's so much more to see. What traveling in a tinted out sedan can do for your body and mind, a VPN can do for your experience online. A while ago, I compared VPN providers and Private Internet Access ended up being the one that checked all the boxes for features like port forwarding and no lock policy and fast service without throttling or filtering, while also being one of the most affordable options. Private Internet Access hides your IP address and encrypts your internet connection. This way, it shields your digital life from the eyes of your internet service providers, network administrators, and government sensors. The client is open source, but you can use any of your own OpenVPN or WireGuard compatible clients as well. Private Internet Access's VPN can move your virtual online location to 84 countries and every single US state, so you can experience the internet as if you were practically anywhere in the world. And Pia, does of course work with all your favorite streaming services and there is no limit to how many devices you can use at the same time. If you need it, they have 24 seven live chat support and you can try them risk-free with their 30 day money back guarantee. Check out the link in the description and get 83% off down to just $2.03 a month and you get an extra four months for free. Thanks again to Private Internet Access for sponsoring this video. So first things first, let's try and find one of these parts that isn't broken. So this is what our part looks like in its full glory when it's not broken. We've got the clip at the bottom here, which is also the pivot point. So you've got the push rod that sort of latches on here and then basically this pushes and back here you have the, I guess the flush tube that this pushes down on. This is a pretty high detail part and reconstructing this in CAD is gonna be a bit of work, I think. But let's get started with the 3D scans first, starting with the iron scan. Hardware setup was quite a bit faster than I remembered. It was just 1 minute 20 until everything was mechanically set up. That, however, changed once I tried setting up the software. The Einscan scanners require activation and licensing and they're pretty locked down and the activation process has always been quite finicky. But now, after having to register for all the newsletters just to download the software, I realized the activation file that I have is not going to work with this current software. Instead, you have to lock your device to an account that I didn't have so far, and it's all online all the time now. But for some reason, their online activation procedure simply wouldn't let me use my scanner. It just told me, hey, the serial number that you're using? We don't know that this thing exists. Hardware's fine, the software is just locking me out. So debugging that would push me into the day's realm of setup instead of the minutes that I'm trying to get here, and that simply wouldn't be fair. But it's one of those things that 3D scanners tend to be pretty restrictive about. And that's just a downside of using an extra piece of like proprietary hardware in a process. You know, calipers, where am I? These, nobody can lock me out of these. Okay, let's hope the second one goes better. This is the 3D Maker Pro Lynx. Um, it's a totally different scanner approach. It's a handheld scanner, and I'm not sure it's gonna have the detail, but we're gonna try anyway. So let's get started. And here, the longest part of the setup was actually just screwing in the locking USB cable. But with that, we end up at the same one minute and 20 second mark. I then spent about a minute setting up the part so that it have access to it from all sides. It needs to be raised off the ground so we can scan the underside as well. 
plugging it in. It's off to boot it right up. However, there is a little problem if you look at the screen in the background here. It is not picking up uh, the red part. You can see it's, it's kind of overexposed, underexposed, but no matter what I do, it does not scan it. It might just be because this is an infrared scanner um, that it doesn't work with the red. I don't know. Uh, I am gonna grab the uh, scanning spray, but unfortunately that does mean masking up and wearing some gloves because this stuff does contain some nasty solvents. I've tried to add as much random stuff to the area as possible to give the scanner an easier time to track. And this stuff is sort of like a, a very light foam dusting on the parts. Look at it, there it is. The scanning process itself is rather simple. You just orbit around the part a couple times until you've covered all the possible angles. In my case, I did three separate scans from sort of three different positions. That took me about 10 minutes. Then you take those three scans and align them and combine them into one big data set. That takes another five minutes of processing time. And then you export that point cloud into a surface model, which is another five minutes roughly. So honestly, this is actually better than what I was expecting. It's picking up all the details, even this little ridge right here. Uh, the knob is pretty okay. There is a good bit amount of noise, like it looks like there's some, some stuff going on at the edges there, but overall I think the shape is all right. Next up, I'm taking the scan file into Mesh Mixer to get it into a printable state. Now I could have done some of this post-processing in the scanning software directly. Uh, I didn't do that, which resulted in some larger files, but doing it in Mesh Mixer just meant it was a bit easier to do and I had more powerful tools at hand. I'm also using the sculpting tools to adjust the shape of the clip area. This is an area that any 3D scanner is going to have a hard time seeing into and creating proper geometry, so I'm just pushing out the shape there a bit to be more clippy. And so far, from taking the scanner off the shelf to having a part that we can now start a first test print with, I spent a total of 33 minutes. So next up, I'm going to try to draw this part in CAD. And because I was rambling in the original recording, here is a voiceover over the voiceover. Uh, what I realized is that really only three features on this part matter, and that is the hook, the square peg, and the fin. Everything else in between, really I could just wing it. I don't have to measure anything as long as those three features end up in the right spots and are shaped correctly. However, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to measure everything exactly. I'm going to draw it exactly just to be fair to the scan. So let's get started and do exactly that. Now, most of the features were pretty straightforward square features that you can pick up with just a pair of calipers, but there were some angles on the part that are a bit harder to measure. So I traced the part onto a piece of paper, extended those lines tangentially, and then measured the angle of those. The total time spent here was 33 minutes, and I checked the footage, yes, it is down to the minute the exact same amount of time I had spent on the 3D scan. So both of these parts are now ready to drop into the slicer. I did a quick check to make sure they are roughly the same size and they matched up really well, which means it's time for a first test print. Man, this input shaping is really speeding things up these days. So there we have the original, the CAD part, and the scan part. Ah, oh, I actually mixed these up. That's the CAD part, and that's the original. So obviously you can see that the original and the CAD design part um, are nearly identical. I can put them on top of each other, and I use calipers, of course, so the dimensions are pretty much spot on. The scanned part is more like an homage to the original. Like all the features are there, and if you look at the proportions, it's a bit wider, but like all the all the dimensions should be pretty much there. All right, let's give this a try. Okay, I'm back from the test fitting session, and I did make some discoveries. Uh, first of all, I don't want to show you the inside of my flush box still, so I made a one to one replica of it, and we're just gonna walk through how these parts fit. Here is the replica of our geometry. It is basically just a six millimeter rod, 12 millimeters wide, and then you have a bit of supporting geometry around it. I added it in as close to the original as I could, but really the only thing that matters is this rod and how wide it is. So taking the original, 
Of course, this fits on here, it swivels nicely with no resistance at all. Taking our CAD part now, uh, this does clip on as well, but it does bind up. And that is because I actually made an error uh, while taking the mentions off of this. And that error happened right here at that little nub at the end of the clip. What I did initially is to just extend the circle of that clip a bit, and then I placed the circle for the nub right dead center on it. And of course, that's, that, that makes sense, right? But if you look at how that interacts with the pivot it's supposed to clip onto, we can see that there is some interference. So our clip is going to spring open and it's going to bind. Instead, what I should have done, and looking closely, that is exactly how the original part does it, is to place that nub on the outside so it's tangential with the inside of that circle. So I changed that. It only took me as long as it took me to explain it to you basically and this CAD part is ready for its second revision. Now our scan part, um, it does fit surprisingly well, like I thought this would fit much worse. So it does kind of clip on, it does kind of swivel, it's too tight still. Overall though it is still too wide and that clip inside diameter is too tight, so I'm gonna fix those two things. And that brings us to the last thing that I noticed, um, and that's that our part that we were taking measurements off of is also broken. I think somebody actually snipped off this, this side rod that's supposed to be there. So of course I'm gonna add that back in. In CAD, and this was just a couple of seconds because all the geometry is already there that I can work off of. For fixing the features on the 3D scan part, I tried Mesh Mixer, I tried Blender, um, but ultimately I ended up using Prusa Slicer. It doesn't have the most sophisticated tools to modify and work with these meshes, but it is very fast and it's very easy to use. I couldn't figure out how to do a boolean intersection, so I just used the cut Z tool, and for adjusting the diameter of the clip and for adding that rod, I just added two cylinders and had one as a negative and one as a positive volume. Overall, adding the second revision was about two minutes in the CAD model for a total of 35 minutes up to now, and for the 3D scan, it was about 10 minutes mostly figuring out what the best approach to adding these changes would be. So the 3D scan part, now at 43 minutes. Huh. So there we have them. Both parts now are actually usable. They work. Um, I had to trim away the 3D scan one just a bit on the nub that fits into this push rod, but overall both of these now work. And to answer our initial question, which one was faster? Well, it actually was the 3D scan version, even though it was quite a different process than doing the CAD. In CAD, really, it's one long workflow. It's, it's pretty flowy once you get into it. You take your dimensions, uh, you create a sketch, you create your feature, and you just keep adding on features until your part looks exactly the way you want to. With 3D scanning, it's more like a stages process. So there's half a different tasks that you have to do in the right order, and you have to do every task more or less well between part prep, between the actual scanning, aligning parts, post-processing the meshes. It's quite a wide skill set that you need to have to get parts that look good. So overall, I actually enjoyed the CAD drawing process more than it did the scanning process. I, I feel like I have more control with CAD, and with scanning it's, it's more like the hardware and the circumstances decide a lot of what your result is going to be like. But also, I must note that the part that we're designing is actually pretty well suited to being drawn up in CAD. It's all straight features, it's just linear extrudes really. Once you have something that is a bit more involved, I don't know, I've got these uh, headphones hanging around here, these would be a bit tougher to draw in CAD, uh, even though they're still relatively straight, but yeah, you know, it's curvy. So there the scanner would have an advantage when it comes to creating uh, parts that are accurate. But then the question popped up for me, like, is this actually how scanners are supposed to be used even? Um, because the scan results are okay, they're usable, but they're not up to the standard of having a smooth surface, crisp features. This is okay, but not super high detail. And I think what the scanners that we have access to at a, at a budget level are more suited towards are 
uh, creating references, creating either a rough scan that you can then import into your CAD tool, into Fusion, uh, and just take measurements off of that or use it as a backdrop and, and trace around it essentially. Or I think what, what especially these scanners that can do a bit more volume are pretty great at is the way that, uh, for example, Superfast Matt uses his scanners. And that is to create a, a reference environment that he can then freely draw his designs in. He took off the wheels, he, he scanned the entire wheel well and all the mounting points. And then in CAD, he just drew up his own features, his own suspension parts right in there, just right off of the scan and all the geometry is there. I think that is a much better use case for these. And for that, the quality that you get is way more than enough. This is like millimeter accuracy roughly. Um, and for that sort of stuff, totally suitable. So there you have it, two completely different ways of creating a functionally identical replacement part. While I did prefer the cat and calipers approach, you know, this thing is pretty good. Having a scanner at your disposal, very useful, even if it's not for directly copying a part. So as always, hope you learned something. Thank you for watching, keep on making, and I'll see you in the next one. Of course, I couldn't leave well enough alone, so I made a topology-optimized flush lever. This thing's never gonna break.